Thai Dam, which is 85 billion cubic meters. Floods do not need canals. It never happened before. I have been following water around the world for the last 50 years, and not once did I hear that a country controlled floods through digging canals. It does not happen. And here, let me digress a little bit to Yungkule Canal. Yungkule Canal started as a colonial project in 1904. It is a colonial project today in 2022. Have no uh, uh, mishaps about that. And if you design, let us suppose that you design a house, you want to build a house, so you make the maps, you bring the architectural engineer, the structural engineer, the contractor. You cannot take that literature and go and build a work, or take that literature and go and build a store or a hut. So the design, the basic design and concept of the Yunkule Canal had one objective, to drain about 4.5 billion cubic meters from the sand into the main Nile to go to Egypt, period. There's nothing else. There was no objective. 1904, 1907, this design came out in 1946 by Egypt. Dikes are designed through satellite imagery as a start. Anybody can actually commission satellite imagery. You pay $3,000, $4,000, $5,000, and you define the coordinates where you want the pictures to be taken at the time, and you can have it. It is in the public domain now. Then you decide the runoff, and then you decide the discharge, where the water is going. You block that water to go somewhere else. You don't block it, period. You block it to go somewhere else. Floods are not rivers. They will change direction. The flood will come this year through that part. Next year it will come through another part. Everybody knows that. So we have to be prepared for that. If there is a will, professional consulting and technical advice, funding, experts, floods can be prevented through dikes, if not prevented, mitigated. And of course, the famous sayings are that nature, if you want to control nature, you have got to obey. You cannot control the rain. The rain will fall if we like it or not. It will run if we like it or not. So how do you deal with something that you cannot control? That is different from dealing with things that you can actually control. So we have got to know the power of nature and see how we can live with it, adapt to it, rather than fight it. I always talk about Hafiz because between 50 to 55 percent of our population in South Sudan are either pastoralists or dependent on pastoralists. That's a very large number of people. Hafiz are not a hole in the ground. Hafiz are not a pond. Hafiz are dams. The feasibility study, the design, the construction, the usage, the lifetime have got to be decided scientifically for Hafir to survive. The first Hafir that I designed as you provide the construction in South Sudan, one of them was 500,000 cubic meters. It was active for about 30 years. In a Hafir, the deposits, the soil deposits are 20 centimeters every year. So if you dig a Hafir that is 4 meters deep, after 10 years, it will be 2 meters deep because of the sedimentation unless you move the sedimentation. It can be deepened or dredged to remove the sedimentation. There are means for doing that. 
also because of the pastoralists for the grass. You have got to put the hafils along the grass root and you have got to space it in series so that when the uh, cattle need to drink, they find another hafil in front of them. Otherwise, you are going to have trouble of the tribes fighting over the source of water. What about capacity? Somebody who tells you that we are doing the 10,000 cubic meters hafir, you can tell him to go and fly a kite. You need a hafir that survives. You need a hafir that will give water to the humans, to the domestic animals, and to the wildlife, and count evaporation of 10, 15% and count sedimentation of 20 centimeters per year. Rights and benefits. The principle of rights and benefits came about in 1992. And it came out by Canada. And I was part of that in 1992. The conceptualization, the rights of water lie in the lakes region or the Ethiopian Peninsula. The usage is in Sudan and in Egypt. And we will come to what Egypt uses. And the principle was when we need water, Egypt is 105 million inhabitants. We cannot let them die of thirst. That does not happen. So what is, what is the balance? The balance is not building a hotel. The balance is not setting up a generation plant of one, of one kilowatt or one megawatt. It has got to be equitable rights for benefits. If you are going to take my water, you have got to pay for it. And not peanuts. It has got to be in, it has got to be equitable. Before that, I would very much encourage our honorable legislators to dig deeper together with the relevant mysteries. What are our rights? I give you an example. The 1959 agreement decided that the total discharge of the Nile at the Swan Dam was 85 billion cubic meters of water. 55 and a half billion of that went to Egypt according to the agreement. Eighteen and a half billion of that went to Sudan. Those guys sat down and decided that they own 100% of the waters, of the Nile waters. And to add insult to injury, there is a clause in the agreement that says, even in the future, even if there is more discharge, it shall be divided between the two countries only. So we have got to know those rights. This takes me to the CPA. The CPA is 261 pages. 101 of those pages are the implementation matrix. In all those 261 pages, the nine waters do not feature. It was not discussed. And for a reason, we didn't go very much into that but there was a valid reason at that time. This does not mean we keep our eyes closed now. Out of the share of Sudan, 18 and a half billion cubic meters, Sudan never used more than 12 billion cubic meters. So Egypt was having gratis free of charge, six and a half billion cubic meters every year. Where is the share of South Sudan? Nobody talked about that until today. South Sudan separated, there was quite a bit of discussion and processes of uh, separating the dates, who takes what and so on, but nobody talked about the water. It is time that the legislation starts that and asks the question, what are our current rights of the Nile? Another point, I don't like very much to go into politics. I, I love going into policies because that's my business, but the politics are, are your business. But this one is important. There are 11 countries that contribute 
to the Nile waters, the, the whole Nile. Eritrea contributes less than 1%, and until recently they refused to sit with the Ethiopians even in a football match. So they were really inactive in the Nile Basin initiative. There are five countries that have signed on the Cooperative Framework Agreement. Four of those countries have ratified the agreement. Where does South Sudan lie? Ask yourself that question. Do you lie with Sudan and Egypt who refused to sign the agreement? Or do you lie with your brothers and sisters of the next region, the African nations? The option is yours. But there is criticism that why, why doesn't South Sudan sign on the uh, Comprehensive Framework Agreement? The Nile is the only basin, the only major basin in the world that hasn't got a Cooperative Framework Agreement. There are 27 major basins in Africa and they all have cooperative agreements. I understood from one of my friends in the parliament that the bill is actually with the parliament. I would very much encourage the honorable uh, members of the parliament to see where that bill is and decide where do they belong. Are they Africans? Or are they in the camp of the Arabs? The choice is yours. I would also encourage the parliament to study the nine agreements of the Nile. There are nine agreements that are of importance for, to us as South Sudanese. And if the parliament doesn't have a record of those, I let anybody get in touch with me and I will furnish them with the agreements. Brother Michael McWay had them very many years back when I gave them to him, but I am sure in his movement they might be lost by now. Our colleagues from the Ministry of Water Resources may have them, but I have them in my archives and I am more than willing to share them. We also need to study our basins well because, as I said, there are 27 known basins in Africa and all of them without exception have got cooperative agreements with the exception of the Nile, which is the longest river in the world. Why do we bring that now with, with all this confusion and so on? What, what is the value of these colonial agreements? If and when you decide to go into litigation or arbitration or mediation, those colonial agreements can be very powerful tools for you. So we need to make ourselves aware of them and we need to decide how do they relate to us. Where do we get that information? There are two general areas where you can get records relating to South Sudan. Previous Sudan, South Sudan now. And that's the British archives, which are very close to number 10 down in the street in London, and the University of Durham in the northern parts of England. Durham has one of the largest records on Sudan, South Sudan. There is a little bit of payment that needs to be made for reproduction, but it is peanuts. Anytime if there is a problem in settling these fees, uh, if certain documents are required, we are talking about 200, 300 dollars, at any time I am willing to pay that so that the documents get sent to the parliament. South Sudan needs to embark on a serious institutional capacity building for the legal and water cadre of South Sudan. 
and both are important, the legal aspect and the hydrology hydraulics aspect. Let me just explain very quickly what is hydrology about, the science of water. Hydrology is the science of water. It is divided into two. There is no cell to them. The first one is hydrology with a GY at the end. That is the discharge, the quantity of water. And the hydraulics with the CS at the end. And that is the energy in the water. If you take the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance down, there isn't a single cubic meter that is intended for taking it outside the lake or having cultivation. They are only using the hydraulics in the water. Create a head, bar the water, create a head, bring the water into the turbines, and the turbines will generate electricity. So this is the hydrodam, and it falls under the hydraulics science. Bahr al-Ghazal Basin, and I send the message particularly for any members of parliament from Bahr al-Ghazal. Bahr al-Ghazal Basin is the only basin with all its tributaries that belongs 100% to South Sudan. It does not come from Ethiopia, it does not come from Lake Victoria, it does not come from the Bibor. So this is your right within your territory. Nobody can have any claim to it. This is why whoever wanted to dredge started with Bahr al-Ghazal Basin because nobody is going to have a claim to it. We need to open our eyes and we need to read between the lines and under the lines and through the lines. That is the main objective of selecting Bahr al-Ghazal for dredging because nobody is going to come out and say why you are doing that. This is your water. You have got oil under the ground, you have got this water above ground. With one difference, the barrel of oil that you take out, that's it, cannot be replaced. We call this non-renewable resource. Water is a renewable resource. So, Guard it, or we should all guard it with our lives. I have one more short presentation for you, just so that we are on the same page of what do we mean by credible feasibility study. If you could please uh, give us that one. People talk about feasibility study and they normally talk about economic and social. That's not all. When you have got such a serious issue, it's not only those two. So we should not limit ourselves. We should educate about ourselves. When a bill comes to you, you want to know that a comprehensive, credible, implementable, and sustainable feasibility study has been done. You need to study the economic impact assessment and the value added of the project. You need to study the cost and benefit feasibility. How much are you spending? How much are you going to get? If we implement the project in conflict on conflict prone areas, will it exacerbate the conflict? And in which case, we need to go do a peace and conflict impact assessment. Ecological, climate, and environmental impact assessment. And we don't want to go into semantics, but 
those are three different areas that need to be studied. Women's lens, always forgotten, always comes at the last. I was here years back and Canada funded a project called Security Sector Reform. And Dr. Riyad Mashar at that time decided he was going to be the focal point for the project and he directed me to work on security sector reform among, among the police. And I went to the parliament to see who were the heads of the specialized committees, the all party specialized committees. I find only two, and the women told me that we only got this because the men did not want them. So I think we need to use the women lens all the time. I will encourage you to go to the charters. I will encourage you to go to the charters of the AU. There are very strong charters on the rights of women. Regrettably, they are not implemented. So if you want to do that, if you want to do the studies, you have got to use the women lens. How, how will they be affected and what can they contribute? Political risk impact assessment. This is a typical case. If you want to study, if you want to stop the Egyptians, it is not a joke. Egypt is 105 million and their army is 920,000 and their gross domestic product is 336 billion dollars. It's not a joke. As a political force, they are not a joke. As an economic force, they are not a joke. So we need to be careful and weigh what is the political risk if somebody has got ambitions in our resources and we don't want him to fulfill that ambition, how are they going to stop them? How are we going to make sure that they will not turn around the corner and hurt us in another way? So that's an assessment that has got to be done. Water security impact assessment. When I was in dialogue with a coin, and I was very happy that General Kur came into the picture because water security is national security. All over the world, wherever you go, water security falls under the national security. Then also if you want to do a study we need to do what we call a trajectory or a projection. Do we want to study for 10 years, 15 years, to look at the scenarios of 10 years, 15 years, or 50 years, or 100 years? So we have got to decide on the time frame for which we are going to do the study. Collateral damage impact. Example, if any of you are from West Equatoria, if you look at the map, you will find that West Equatoria is called the Green Belt. Why was it called the Green Belt? The reason is that the water evaporates from the sud, then the northern winds blow the evaporation, and it falls as rain in Western Equatoria and Northern Uganda. You never hear of a famine there. You never hear of a drought there. Dry the sud, and you can kiss that goodbye. Impact on wildlife. You have got a wealth of wildlife. This is not time for tourism. If you say South Sudan, people are not going to say, well, I'm going to go there tomorrow. But we have got to prepare for that tomorrow. Once we have more stability, once we have more structures, people are going to see the animals. Look at Kenya. The main source of revenue for Kenya is tourism. And it is from their uh, animal reserves. Social impact assessment, and at the top of that is the human relations. Especially we are in communities where tribalism is the main frame of reference for us. You ask someone, where do you come from? He will say, I'm a Dinka or a Shuluk or a Morley. 
So we have got to be careful about that so that we don't produce unintended negative impacts. Best alternative is study. We don't do any study. What are the alternatives? If we're not going to dredge, what are we going to do? And then you have got to evaluate those alternatives to come out with the best alternative. This is a long process, but we have got to endure so that we have got, as Barnaba said, we need to have informed decisions. You cannot be informed if you are not, if you are not patient. Livelihood impact assessment. The pastoralists, about 50-55% of our population are either pastoralists or dependent on pastoralists. How will they be affected? When you are talking about that, who are the primary stakeholders? Those who will be affected directly by any results or any action. Who are the secondary uh, uh, stakeholders? So you need to do a research among the communities to see who they are as well. Land ownership, and this is a matter of life and death in South Sudan. Impact on indigenous, some people do not like the term indigenous. I use it at the people who have been there before anyone else. So indigenous of the area. How will they be affected? Do they have rights? Health impact assessment on both human and animals. Now, let me very quickly give you my recommendations for what I believe you can consider. I'm switching the channel of guys to the news. The first recommendation. And traditional leaders have handed in nearly 200 guns to the security committee in Twont in Warab State. Hello dear viewers of SSBC, welcome to this evening edition coming to you live from the capital of Juba with me, Bakita Kundiga Bium. And now we start with our news bulletin. The Commissioner General of the National Revenue Authority, Patrick Mugoya, briefed President Kiel on revenue collection for the past six months. The Executive Director in the Office of the President, James Dingwell, said the team also presented their five-year plan to the President. In speaking to the media, Patrick Mugoya said they requested the government to approve their human resource policy to recruit and train their staff. Five-year strategic plan for National Revenue Authority. After the lengthy deliberation, Commissioner General and his team will present His Excellency a cash flow, a cash flow on, you know I mean, of National Revenue Authority over the year. And the projection on the five-year a strategic plan on how the increase of the uh, collection and not every collection would result if this uh, strategic plan is fully implemented by our government. In his request, he, he requests His Excellency for his support to make sure this strategic plan is implemented. In return, His Excellency appreciate the presentation by the Commissioner General and his team and he commented them to continue increasing a national revenue authority. And collection should always scale up for our people to benefit from their revenues. The initiatives that uh, NRA is going to implement in the next five years is approved by the NRA Board of Directors. And uh, we requested uh, uh, the President uh, that uh, the process of approving the document by the government is fast tracked because we are now uh, are, are already into the first year of, of, of implementing the strategic plan. We have uh, requested for specific support uh, from the government that is uh, providing the necessary resources to NRA to implement the 
I'm now talking about what uh, legislators from both houses participated in the public consultation on soot wetlands and wide Nile water resource management gathering in Juba on Wednesday. During the debate, experts cited the importance of institutional capacity building to conduct credible feasibility studies and collect public views. As Daniel Marengwek reports, some experts recommended establishment of an independent commission to oversee the management of water resources. The forum drew together lawmakers from the Council of States and Transitional National Legislative Assembly to listen to the experts and explore on vibrant topics on the Wild Nile Basin management and its governance. Professor Tachel Tezin, an international expert on Nile water, underscored the importance of feasibility studies. Al Kazin recommended establishment of a commission to oversee water management in South Sudan. The feasibility study, the design, the construction, the usage, the lifetime have got to be decided as scientifically for our fish to survive. An expert, Dr. Silwag Jibril, recommended conducting public hearing and commissioning of scientific studies. Made on all sides and took this historic unprecedented decision to call the nation for a public consultations and a forum to look into all aspects of the dredging and the issues of the water resources. And as I said, Professor John Lechou explained variability between dredging and river cleaning. Doesn't destroy, this doesn't affect the biota, doesn't affect the livelihood, doesn't affect the environment. Then that kind of dredging is sustainable and is acceptable. The Minister of Presidential Affairs, Dr. Barnaba Marial Benjamin, said the forum has offered a credible chance to the participants to explore possibilities. What we heard from our experts, the wonderful information which a member of parliament really needs for you to sit in your chair and bang the table and say this is the right decision to take. Our government had yet not discussed anything to do with John Lincoln. The Assembly Pest Deputy Speaker Nathaniel Oyet says the Parliament would not entertain any person who attempt to divert public concern into tribal verses. On her part, the Deputy Speaker of the Council of States, Mary Ayan Machuk, congratulated the President for initiating such an interactive platform in which she said it would produce tangible results. I would like to underscore that and emphasize and underline after that we are seized of this matter. We want to see short term and long term solution to the flood disaster. I would like also to point out there is no need to politicize the matter of natural disaster. So I understand a bit the importance of water. I understand how South Sudan is one of the blessed and gifted countries all over the world. The chair of the organizing committee, Akoja Kweimanim, described Nile water as a lifeline for the people of South Sudan. And then scoring that the white Nile, including the eight tributaries, is the lifeline of the people of South Sudan. The first day of the forum is expected to bring together the cabinet to explore important topics on sewed wetlands and the Wild Nile Water Resources Management. Daniel Marengwe, SSBC News, Juba. A workshop on sewed wetlands and water management opened in Juba on Wednesday. The workshop brought together participants from the Ministries of Water Resources and Irrigation, Livestock and Fisheries and Environment, as well as experts from the region. Isaac Loduro asked more in the following report. The Undersecretary and the Minister of Water Resource and Irrigation, Emmanuel Lado, called for the inclusion of academician and university students in the Nile Basin programs. This came up during a two-day workshop on wetlands water resource management in Juba on Wednesday. The objective of this day, um, South Sudan Wetlands Expert Working Group, is to validate the South Action Plan and raise the awareness of kind of the South Pitlands study for ensuring a proper pro, uh, product dissemination across the stakeholders. If the financial base to allow, let's ensure that for the next few days, 
we increase the participants, especially members, I'm not saying members from the University of Juba and, uh, and academia in general, if they could also be uh, brought forward to participate in one or the other. Since this is the final version of the document, I think it's important that they have a grasp. The Deputy Executive Director of the Nile Basin Initiative Secretariat, Dr. Michael Kiza, said the initiative will contribute to the Sud Wetlands Management Strategy. The is also an opportunity for awareness raising of these products so that we can take them on and use them for your planning and the work that we do in the ministries. So Again, they are part of the success of this undertaking and it shows quite collaboration between us and the Meanwhile, the director of police sector and regulation, Francis Wajo, said it is the responsibility of the Nile Basin member states to manage their resources. The soap wetlands will not be easy. It is a very important ecosystem for us, not only for South Sudan, but for the region, even global. As you also know, so it's also under threat from different factors. So it is our responsibility as countries, it is our responsibility as members of the Nairobi Initiative to manage this, this resource so that we are able to have a good livelihood out of it. The Nile Basin Initiative consists of 10 countries, including South Sudan. The platform was also envisioned as a mechanism for dissemination of the chemical outputs and products in the country. Isaac Ludori Emanuel, SSBC News. And UNESCO Acting Head of Mission Major General Benjamin Olifemi Soya briefed the Presidential Advisor on National Security Affairs, Trude Gelwath, on the general security situation in Abia. Benjamin said he also briefed the Presidential Advisor on the activities of the UN agency in the area. The meeting discussed restoring peace and stability and addressing the final, the final status of Abia. Tud Gelwak urged UNESCO to work for the interests of the people and deliver their mandate in accordance with the laws of the country. Meeting with the Presidential Advisor on uh, National Security, it has been a very fruitful uh, meeting which hanged on um, issues that have national security imperatives. Uh, with regards to ABA, uh, the UNISPA activities in the ABA box. We have spoken extensively on issues that um, will um, help UNISPA to achieve its mandate uh, with regards to the ABA box. And I want to assure you that uh, the deliberation we had with the presidential advisor was very fruitful and we believe that with this kind of engagement, um, the final status of APA will be um, achieved at the shortest possible time. The body of General Questionnaire Mathon Conant, who died in Juba last week, has been flown home for burial. Paying his last respect, the Minister of Presidential Affairs, Dr. Barnaba Mirel Benjamin, said General Conant played a major role in the liberation struggle. one of our commanders that has done his job and he is asking all the people of South Sudan, the government and the leadership, we should all of us say thank you very much General Kitchener, you have played your role, you have done your job, let us all pray for him and the president has promised to see his family and to do all that he can in order to see that the family of late General Kitchener is, is well looked after. This is his message to the people, the family of our General Kitchener, to the people of Murla area, to the people of South Sudan, and to the leadership and the government of this country. That we have lost a hero and we should say thank you, a job well done. That 
The Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Mayiga Yiding, received copies of credentials from the new South African Ambassador. Minister Mayig also met with the UNESCO delegation in Juba, where they discussed cooperation between the two institutions. More in the following report. The Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Mayika Yideng, met with South African Ambassador Malodi Maufe, who came to present letters of recall of his predecessor and deliver his letters of credence ahead of confirmation by the President. In her statement to SSBC after the meeting, the spokesperson in the office of the Minister, Adu Jogwen, said the meeting also touched on strengthening cooperation between the two countries. The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Maik Aide, held two meetings this morning. The first being with the designate ambassador from South Africa to South Sudan. He handed his credentials over to the Honourable Minister and is looking forward to a meeting with the, His Excellency the President in order to hand those credentials over and begin the work of bolstering economic cooperation between the two countries. The Honourable Minister remarked how our nation's cooperation began out of struggle and he's grateful to be here in a day where we're able to move beyond the struggle and create opportunities that benefit both nations, both culturally and economically. In a separate news development, Minister Mayika Yi also received a team of United Nations Interim Security for Abiei UNISFA, led by Major General Benjamin Olufemi Sweya. Speaking to SSBC after the meeting, the UNISFA team leader said they discuss security situation in Abiei and the need to discuss the final status of Abiei area. In the movement of uh, the contingent on equipment for the Italian Battalion that came by road from uh, Juba to the Abiei box. We also want to thank him for the role he played in ensuring that the joint traditional uh, leaders peace conference uh, took place in Entebbe. Um, as you know, it is important that the two uh, communities meet to discuss on issues that pertain to the peace and security of the ADA box. I want to say that we have positively gotten a response from His Excellency, the Minister for Foreign Affairs. And I believe that with this type of cooperation, um, the final status of ADA will be finally uh, resolved at the shortest possible time. The Honourable Minister thanks UNISPA for their work in the ABA area and the positive cooperation they've had with the government of South Sudan. The Honourable Minister will also be facilitating for UNISPA to collaborate with the RRC to support those affected by the conflict in ABA. The Minister reiterated His Excellency the President of the Republic's commitment to our new chapter of peace with Sudan and looks forward to working to continue in the work with the Sudanese government in order to arrive at the final status of ABA. Furthermore, the Honourable Minister will be holding discussions with leadership in the Ministry of Interior to address various challenges within the ABA bloc, including those within the northeastern region. The Minister of General Education and Instruction, Awuding Ajwil, and the Director General of the British Foreign Affairs for Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean, Corinne Robertson, discussed supporting girls' education and the problem facing teachers in the country. Minister Awuding commented the British government for supporting the country's education sector. Speaking to the media after the meeting in Juba on Wednesday, Corey Robertson said they would work with the government to fund education programs in the country. This is a national gas program led by the British government. has been um, transform education, let me say that, because uh, the majority of the students uh, who are out of school by then look at school. But with this initiative, uh, we have narrowed the gap. And, and I'm sure with the continuation of this program, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of action. And we wanted to, to appreciate the British government uh, with the support, continued support, even when we know that they have a difficult situation economically. We had a very good exchange discussing um, some of the challenges around education in South Sudan and how, how education is, is so important for the future of this wonderful country. We also talked about how we can work together about the UK and international partners on the to support the work of the Minister. And, and we've also talked about the importance of, of resources and ensuring that, uh, that the money flows 
down where it really matters and the resources get to the state and to the schools. Um, and finally, we talked about uh, the importance of girls' education and ensuring that, that girls can go to school as well as boys and how that can be transformation. Let's go for this short break and we shall be right back with more news. The National Revenue Authority briefs President Kiir on its six months revenue collection. Legislators participate in the public consultation on suit wetlands and wild Nile water resource management in Juba. And traditional leaders have handed in nearly 200 guns to the Security Committee in Tonj in Warab State. Welcome back from that short break and now to proceed. The National Minister of Gender, Child and Social Welfare, Aya Wereli, said they would work with civil societies and legislators to devolve a bill to address violence against women. She made the statement during a meeting with representatives of 13 national non-governmental organizations in Juba, representative of the group. Kaunde David called on the government and parliament to speed up removal of barriers against conflict-related sexual violence. Looking at the provisions, uh, uh, I think we, 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 we can start working slowly domesticating this, uh, this model. Um, I've happily received this and I've given them my word that as a ministry we are going to be uh, working towards the domestication of this problem. So we recommend that the Law Review Commission uh, uh, assesses the model legislative provisions on conflict-related sexual violence for potential inclusion in the anti gpv bill and South Sudan's criminal and civil justice. The National Minister of Roads and Bridges, Simon Mijok Mijak, and Chief Administrator Stefano Wiel Milik discuss improving the roads in drawing administrative area linking Lake No, Pariang, and Jao. Minister Mijok Mijak said they will include the cost of the road in the 2022-2023 budget. Stefano Wiel said the completion of Lake No, Pariang, Jao road will improve the economic situation of the communities. Uh, we are delighted to take it over and we will try our best to include it in our physical year 2022-2023. Uh, uh, we have other issues of service delivery uh, which we have shared together and issues related to uh, security of the administrative area. Uh, we'll continue to work together uh, on Legno, uh, Arianjao, as well as uh, the road proposed to connect uh, Ariang from Panakwe up to Awarping and Abiemno, and we will go further even to Abie. So I also thank him for his leadership in leading this process. And this was a promise of the president, and he has taken it up to ensure that this road uh, is completed in the nearest future. And, and I'm happy that this has been included in the annual budget for 2022-2023. Uh, the road is, is of a strategic importance because it will provide access to market to our people, will improve the economic livelihood. 
We now go to war where Governor Sahara Cleto Asan briefed the National Minister of Youth and Sports, Dr. Albino Boldio, on preparations to host Olympic Games in Wao this month. In a separate development, Dr. Albino Bold received communication equipment donated by the United Nations Population Fund. Den Madwok asks more on the following report. The Minister of Youth and Sport, Dr. Albino Boldio, met with the Governor of Western Baro Gazal State, Sarah. Kilito Hassan in Juba on Wednesday. The governor briefed the minister on the readiness of the state to host the Olympic Games. The governor invited the minister to attend the event. Speaking to SSBC, Dr. Albina Boldu appreciated the role being played by the government of Western Barra Ghazal State in uniting the communities through sport activities. Uh, 23rd is uh, the, the, the International Olympic Day. And this year, the Minister of Youth and Sport, we have decided instead of celebrating it in Juba, we want to take it outside into two states. That is Wau, Wau is uh, Western Baragazal and uh, Upper Nile State uh, in Malakal Town. Uh, the Governor briefed me about, uh, her, she brought her official invitation and also she briefed me about the ongoing construction of uh, Jazeera uh, sport complex. Governor Sarah Kalito Hassan said her government is committed to support sport activities, especially in the rural areas. Officially had the uh, invitation uh, to come and attend the, the um, uh, day in Wasemba uh, Hadazar. And we have also uh, sent an official event to uh, Her Excellency Mamarebeka uh, also to come and participate. Uh, we are in, uh, in the state, we are re uh, working uh, in preparation for that and we are asking everyone to support us for the success uh, of this event, especially it's going to be a regional event. In a separate development, Minister Albino Boudio received communication equipment donated by the United Nations Population Fund to easy communication service in the ministry. Speaking to SNBC, Dr. Albino Boudio, Thanks UNFPA for supporting the ministry. This program today is still a continuation of that uh, cooperation that the UNFPA has dedicated to the people, to the young people of South Sudan. So on behalf of my thank you very much for this. UNFPA country director Dr. Kedani Abraham said the organization would work with the ministry to promote sport activities in the country. On behalf of uh, Dr. Ajumara and the UNFPA uh, as a whole, it's my pleasure to, to be with you. And over, you know, South Sudan youth needs, you know, a much deserved respect and also facilitation uh, to, to make sure that they are healthy, productive and Mayor Spelem, Interim Secretary General Peter Lambot, inspected Juba Barkazal Highway on Wednesday. Speaking to the media, Peter Lam described the road as an achievement in the country's infrastructure sector. Steve White files this report. The Interim Secretary General of the Sudan People Liberation Movement, SPLM, Peter Lamboth, inspect Juba Terekeka section of Juba Rubek Highway, connecting Central Equatorial State and Greater Bahar al Ghazal region. The mission is to verify achievement and progress in development programs, especially infrastructural development in the country. Peter Lamboth described what he witnessed as a significant achievement in the service of South Sudanese. The completion of this road between Juba and Terkeka is a historical accomplishment. It has never happened since time of creation. It is SPLM that has done this to the people of South Sudan. And I want to congratulate all who died during the liberation struggle for independence of this country. I also want to urge all our people to remain peaceful with one another so that development can come and be accomplished. Without peace, nothing can be done. And with the transitional government now in full swing, it is our belief that nothing again will happen to affect us. We will work together with the contractor, the Shandong High Speed, and the Ministry for Roads and Bridges, uh, 
to make sure that this road is financed. Because right now, as we have seen, the trunk that is going to Bargazal has already started operations. And so we... The acting undersecretary in the Ministry of Roads and Bridges, Engineer John Kenyusasa, commended the SPLM Interim Secretary General for the visit. He appreciated the good cooperation of the ruling party in the implementation of national road projects. The other challenge is funding issue. Uh, this company started uh, work in 2019 uh, through crude oil uh, for, for road. But up to now, they have not been paid for two years. The crude oil has not been uh, uh, lifted uh, to the company. So the company is using their own resources to help us uh, complete this section. Uh, the other challenge is probably on the section that we have started. We don't know how the communities are going to handle the contractor, but however, we will talk to the communities and agree with them on the uh, local materials. So we hope uh, with our cadres, uh, SPLM is here, they will try to help the ministry so that we secure funds to the contractor so that he completes this role. Ma Wanjun, the charge the affairs in the Chinese embassy in the country, stressed the importance of this project that will facilitate delivering basic services to the people. So this is the job of development and substance. It's the future of South Sudan because it connects almost two-thirds of the population of South Sudan. I believe with the successful resolution of payment issues, Central High Speed will continue to attract this road in high quality and bring more benefits to the people of South Sudan. The chairperson of the South Sudan Relief and Rehabilitation Commission, Dr. Manasseh Lumele Iwaya, and World Food Program discussed the humanitarian situation in the country, especially in conflict areas. In a statement to SSBC, Dr. Manasseh said the commission will work with the World Food Program to assist the people affected by floods. WAP Deputy Country Director Adenyuka Abedejo said they are committed to support areas of need. In brief, of the overall situation in the country, the areas that require to be given support and the lack of resources to World Food Program. We're also well informed about the effort that the World Food Program is making, not only in South Sudan, but internationally, to make sure that those who are in need are given the support that they need. But World Food Program is not only concentrating on providing food, but also working together with small-scale farmers to encourage them to produce food for themselves. Today, we estimate that over 7 million people are food insecure and in need of food assistance. But uh, unfortunately, because of our limited resources as the World Food Program, we are only able to assist 4.5 million people in the country. Um, since April, we've had to cut assistance to 1.7 million people uh, that are in need of our support. But again, because of limited resources, we've had to reprioritize and focus in on the most severe uh, Traditional leaders in Ralbet Payam have voluntarily handed in nearly 200 guns to the security committee in Warab State. This comes after a series of meetings between the traditional leaders and security chiefs. The security committee headed by the chief of defense force, General Santino Dengwa, the inspector of General of Police, General Majaga Kate Malok, and the Director General of National Security Bureau, General Akol Korkuj, are in charge to reduce the tension in the area. In a separate development, the security chiefs also distributed food to more than 3,000 displaced persons last month's violence. As speaking to SSBC, General Majaga Kate Malok commented the traditional leaders for cooperating with the Disarmament Committee. General Majak said they are briefed up they are beefed up 
the number of soldiers in Akop Bayang in Toy North County to disarm civilians carrying guns. The police chief said they have arrested some suspects who are currently in police custody. The acting commissioner of Toy North County, Bak Ajwach, said they will continue to engage the civilians to surrender their guns to the committee. returned to the border town of Nimili as Governor Luis Lubong Lajori pitched calm in the area to restore law and order. Governor Lubong had temporarily transferred his office from Tori to Nimili. Jobs have reopened and movements in the town have resumed. The governor called on the communities residing in Nimili to refrain from causing chaos. Governor Lubong called for peace and harmony in the area to allow people to go about their daily activities. The security organs briefed the governor on the general security situation in the area, saying investigation is ongoing to arrest the perpetrators of the violence. The governor and jointly addressed the security challenges affecting the town. <laughs> Women are gradually getting engaged in developmental activities in the country. SSBC visited Multipurpose Training Center in Juba and talked to the women there. The women involvement in development activities confirms the common adage that what a man can do, a woman can do better. Emmanuel Joyce reports. 
In the current cruel world, South Sudanese National Action Plan for Women, Peace and Security fosters the need of allowing women a space to exercise their skills and talents. Existence of gender bias in South Sudan denies women the power to determine their own success. As Dr. John Garangi stated that women of South Sudan wake up at 5 a.m. to walk five miles to fetch five jerrycans of water. Women continue to show their potential in taking the country forward together with the men. Some women believe that they have the ability and courage to do any kind of work available in their communities. Well, there is nothing that a man can do and a woman cannot do. There are a lot of things that you see a man does and most cases people take it as their mentality that women cannot do what men can do. Some women stress out challenges facing women while in the field of their work. Actually, the time um, other men they are stubborn, they could disturb people in this uh, the workplace. But if you don't have strong heart, even you will leave the work because they will disturb you. Others they disturbing you, conning, conning you, what, telling you a lot of words. The determination of women in promoting development emerged as a part of global movement and is continuing to break new ground in the recent years. One of the men, a builder, asserted that working with women is easier than working with a fellow men because of their compassionate nature in whatever they do. I feel because they are easy to work. If you say you help me with this one, they can help you very fast. They cannot disappoint you like a man. Eh? One of the mechanics said women should be respected and given the same chance to fulfill their careers. Everyone having his own uh, chance or having his own idea of what they choose as her choice so that uh, she can be able to survive. Resilience among the women has developed aggressiveness among the female to claim their rights and freedom despite being denied the chance to influence change in South Sudan. The peace agreement mandates the transitional government of national unity as in chapter 5, article 4.15, subsection 4.15. 1.1 agreed together with subsection 4.15.1.5 appealing for development and capacity building of women at various societies of South Sudan for SSBC News Emanuela Joyce. Thank you, Emanuela Joyce. And that finally brings us to the end of this news hour. On behalf of the team here, I am Bakita Kundiga Bim saying bye-bye for now. Stay tuned for more coming up.